All right, so a couple stands at this altar. We've talked about this for several weeks. They stand at this altar, and they're in front of a pastor, maybe me or another pastor. Maybe they're on a boat, and they're in front of a boat's captain, regardless. They stand in front of a group of witnesses, and they pledge in the eyes of God that they will love one another. Not that they do love one another, but that they will love one another for the rest of their lives. And I ask couples, how in the world, how in the world can you stand before God and know that his word says it's better to never make a vow than to make a vow and break it? How can you stand before a God when you know one of the Ten Commandments is not to bear false witness? How can you stand before a God who says, I hate divorce, and promise that 15, 20, 40 years down the road, you can still and you will still love and they, they look at me and they, well, we'll keep our fingers crossed. You, we don't know what the future holds. We don't know which direction we will go. We don't know what our spouse is going to look like, what they're going to act like. We have no idea. And if our love is based upon a feeling, I'm going to tell you the feeling again can change with a bad burrito. If our love is based upon desire, well, just think about poor Angela Mills. At one time, I wasn't bad looking. Now look at me. I mean, if our love is based upon just a desire to be together, what happens when somebody that we desire to be together with more comes along? How in the world can a couple stand here before witnesses and before God and with a future father-in-law who's carrying a shotgun and pledge, I will love you as long as we both live? My parents in January celebrated 50 years. My grandparents are coming up on 72 years. And I ask, how can you do that? We have some incredible examples in this room of people who have loved for a long time and who have kept it. And the answer is, it cannot be based upon a feeling because feelings change, amen? It cannot be based upon the desire because sometimes we become honestly undesirable. None of us have a pinup of a 90-year-old on our wall. It can't be based upon an attraction. And it can't be based upon there's nobody better. Because somebody better sooner or later will come down the pike. It has to be based on exactly what Paul has given us in 1 Corinthians 13. And it's exactly what we've been talking about. Each one of those things, love is patient, love is kind. Love does not envy, does not boast, is not proud. Love does not seek its own. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Those actions, those decisions make it possible to love without end. Again, it's not a feeling, it's not a desire, it's not an attraction, it's not an emotion. Every one of those things is a decision. And friends, we have the ultimate picture of that kind of decision when we look at that cross and we hear Jesus' words, Father, forgive them. Because I assure you, at that moment, he was not feeling it. I assure you, at that moment, the ones mocking him and spitting at him were not attractive. I believe at that moment he had no desire to be with the Romans who placed the crown in his brow. And yet, he continued to make the decision to seek not his own, to forgive, to not keep a record of wrongs, to look for the good. He made a decision to give up his own rights for the good of others, even if they didn't understand what he was doing. We have this beautiful picture of what it means to love. And then we have this direction. As John says, brethren, love one another as God in Christ has loved you. And so how can we possibly stand at that altar? How can we possibly make a promise that we will love? Because we can make a promise that as long as we're able, we'll get up and go to work. We can make a promise that as long as we're able, we'll drive on the right side of the road. We can make a promise as long as we're able to feed our children. These are not acts of emotion. They are acts of the will. And so we come to 1 Corinthians 13, and I just want to share it with you one more time 
before we leave our summer of love. Verse 1, if I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but I don't have love, I'm like a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all ministries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but I don't have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And say this with me, please. Verse 8. Love never fails. Now where there are prophecies, they will cease, and where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. And when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away these childish things behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, and then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these th three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. Say this with me. But the greatest of these is love. Love. The word here is one that we miss in our culture because we love French fries, amen? I love Stewart's root beer. We use the word, we throw it around, and it seems to be almost meaningless to us. But the word in Greek is agape. You've heard it before, haven't you? Agape. Say that with me. Agape. It's not agape. Hooked on phonics will not work right here. It's agape. And refers to an unconditional love, a sacrificial, supernatural love, that quality of love that God is. The love that God shows, that quality of love that God's Spirit enables us as His children to manifest. It's a supernatural love. It is, it is a love that looks at somebody that's unlovable and still says, I love you. It's a love that regardless of how it feels, will act loving. It's a love that can only come from God. Here, Paul is saying to us, God is saying to us that agape love, the supernatural love that he's been describing and we've been talking about for weeks, never. Now let's look at this word, never. You know what this word never means? Never. It does. It means not even ever. Not even at any time, never at all, neither at any time, never, never, nothing, anything, nothing. And so we see that this kind of love never what? And the next word is fails. The word is pipto. Not pepto like bismol, but pipto. And metaphorically, pipto is used to mean that it falls away or it fails to be without effect. It denotes to fall and that which falls ceases its activity. The fall of the Roman Empire, the fall of Adolf Hitler. This means that they no longer cease. They no longer function. They cease to function. And so we see here that Paul, in three incredible words, tells us that agape love never, say it with me, fails. Love never fails. Love Agape love never fails. Wow. The banks may fail. Your car will fail. Your college student may fail. Your heart may fail. But get this, better than FDIC insurance, 
God's love, agape love, say it with me, never fails. You want a sure bet? You want to place your trust in something that you know is 100% insured? Place it in love. Winston Churchill is a hero of mine. I love how he uses this word never. Never, 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 never give up. And wasn't it awesome, despite the bombs, despite the attacks, despite the, sometimes the retreat, the British people during World War II never gave up. You see, because they never gave up, the Germans did. And when love refuses to give up, when love stays strong, I'm going to tell you what diminishes its hatred. It is sorrow. It is loneliness. How do we do this? George M. Moore, Jr., a member of the U.S. House of Representatives, said this, a winner is just a loser who tried one more time. Love never fails. It was almost 25 years ago. I was looking at the most beautiful bride in the history of the world. There were 800 people at our wedding, and that was just the bridesmaids and the groomsmen. There was flowers and music and all kinds of incredible singing and trumpets that played fanfares when they came down the aisle, a kneeling bench where we could have communion, and three preachers. And we looked at each other, and romantically we gazed into each other's eyes. And we said, I will love you as long as we both shall live. And then we took off the tux and we took off the wedding dress and the hard work of that vow came in the very next day. Is love easy? No. Is love always fun? No. But is love possible? Yes. Is it possible to have an unfailing love? Yes. And our example is Jesus Christ. And Paul tells this church at Ephesus, husbands, love your wives, agape, like Christ loved the church. To love the way the preceding verses prescribe means that we can give and receive unfailing love. Love that never ends, love that never lets go, love that never disappoints. We can absolutely stand before each other when we pledge to be church members together and know that we can and we will love. Isn't that awesome? No matter how bad the preacher messes up, no matter what kind of music we sing, no matter, they could paint one side of the church orange. Oh, God, help us. They could paint the other side black and gold. Lord, help us. And yet we could still love we could be a church of Democrats and Republicans and Independents and whatever else there is, and yet we could love. Isn't that awesome? You could take a Tennessee fan and marry a Vanderbilt fan, and they could still love one another. It's rare. But it happens. I'm going to tell you something. I do not have this kind of love for Kentucky football. I divorced them last night. Friends, I started in the ministry almost 30 years ago, 1987. I've been in the full-time ministry since 1991. My Bible studies, my sermons, the songs that I pick, I don't say this to boast, but this is my theme. And I'm going to tell you something. This is the theme that this church chose for itself. The first time we gathered together as leadership in, in my ministry here, we sat down and we said, who are we? And somebody said, we're a friendly church. And somebody else stood up and said, but we need to be more. We want to be what? A loving church. Amen? Husbands and wives ought to love one another. Parents ought to love children. Children ought to love parents. And we ought to enjoy the 
the relationships that we have, and we also ought to love the world. This is my theme because it's the theme of the Old Testament. Ashley read out of Isaiah today. Could you tell that God loves us from what she said? Have you not known? Have you not heard? It's the theme of the Gospels. Yes, the gospel is what drives our ministry, but I'm going to tell you what. The gospel is this. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. There is no gospel without love. It spreads through the world in the book of Acts. It permeates the letters of Paul. It dominates the letters of John. Everything that we stand upon comes from the nature of God, and God is love. And we need to love the way that he has loved us. Oh, I say it loudly because I'm passionate about it. God hates divorce. We ought to hate divorce. God hates division in the church. We ought to hate division in the church. I cannot help but think that God hates what's going on in our nation today. Because we choose our political sides and we put them before our God. We put them as Democrats or Republicans before the fact that we're Christians. We put our race before our God. We put our financial status before our God. For crying out loud, we even put our sports teams before our God. He has to look down and be heartbroken because the command is to love God and to love one another. And friends, let us be honest. We have failed to love. The gospel, then love. The gospel is love. 1 Corinthians 13, 8. Read it again with me. Love never fails. I'll tell you what. If you want to be a great church, let's just start and stop right there. I'm just going to tell you. Some people like a great orator. And I'm going to tell you what, you can stay home and I'll just admit it right now. You can look up almost any sermon on YouTube and they will all be better than me. You can find a lot more comfortable chair at home that relaxes, reclines, hits your lumbar just right and vibrates. And you can put on a set of headphones and just make the world go away. You can sit on the back porch and, and listen to the birds tweet. And you can sit down with a, with a, a cup of Starbucks that's bigger than a gallon. And you can listen to the great orators of our day. And I'm going to tell you something. That's not what love does. Love, love is more important than the prophecies. It's more important than the orations. Because it says of the prophecies they will cease. It's more important than all the spiritual manifestations and the great show and all these people showing off. I love Ashley singing. I love to hear Adam. I love to hear Ken. But I'm going to tell you something. If none of that were here and you were still here, I would love to be here. Because all those gifts won't be necessary someday. Where there is knowledge, no matter how great the teaching, it will pass away. He goes on to indicate that all those things are necessary now, but one day they won't be. But I'm going to tell you what abides. Faith, hope, and love. But what? The greatest of these, say it, is love. You want to be a great church? Love. You want to be a great husband? Love. You want to be a great friend? Love. You want to be a great father? Love. You want to be a great daughter? Love. You want to be a great employee? Love. These three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Let me just give you three things today that we need to take away from these three words. Number one, receive this love. Some of you today may be feeling beat up because you haven't loved this way. You may be thinking, I could have... I could have worked harder on my marriage. I I could have done a better job with my children. I've lost it before, and I shouldn't have lost it. I, I haven't called my parents in years. I'm estranged from a family member. I've left a half a dozen churches. I've caused another church to split. I don't care. Because listen to me today. Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. He loves you this way. 
You might mess up, you might fail, you might be a total abject failure in your own eyes, but I'm gonna tell you something, in God's eyes, he loves you as much as he's ever loved you. He will never love you more than he does right now. He doesn't care about your failures. He only knows your potential. Remember, love doesn't look at your iniquity, but it looks at the good things. Today, don't feel guilty. Don't carry around the weight. Don't carry around the sin. Don't carry around the care. Don't carry around the failure. No, the only thing that doesn't fail is love. And that's how God loves you. Stop being cynical. Stop, stop looking around the room and saying, oh, they say they love me, but they're not gonna love me. I'm gonna tell you something. God loves you, but he can also supernaturally endow other people in this room and around the world to love you that way too. And here's the cool thing. It's the second thing that I want you to see. God wants you to love this way. You remember the old song, walk this way. I think we'll sing that next Sunday. No, the word is love this way. That's the command. Spouses, boys and girls. Paul is not saying here that erotic love never fails. Erotic love will fail. The thing that attracts you to your mate initially, I gotta tell you, man, I'm, it's almost embarrassing. But here I am, a geeky trumpet player. There are other ones in this room. And I'm sitting there walking around in my geeky band uniform. And there's this majorette in front of me. And it was her personality that attracted me first. I'm a liar. She was so pretty. My goodness. And I'm going to tell you something. She's still pretty. But that's not what keeps us together. Love will keep us together. Not erotic love. But the supernatural love. This agape love. Family, you only stay together when you love one another this way. And nothing's greater than family. Amen? Nothing's worse than family, but nothing's greater than family. And friends, we're not talking about phileo love here, friendly love. We're not talking about the city of brotherly love. We're talking about agape love between friends. A love that permeates and goes deep. A love that says, I desire to be with you, to, to know what's going on in your life, to be there through the hard times. And I'm the one, I want you there in my hard times. We're supposed to love this way, love this way. We're supposed to love like this. I'm going to tell you, there's a third thing that we need to see here. Not only receive this love, and that's the only way we can love. And not only are we supposed to love this way, our spouses, our family, our friends, even our boss. We're to do church this way. And this is precisely why Paul gives the church at Corinth this passage. Do not miss this. We ought to do church this way. I'm going to just tell you right now. Don't just attend to hear the sermons or the music. That's silly. You could go online and listen to it. The reason I come every week is because I get paid. No. I will always go to church. Why? Because I love the people there. I'll tell you what, if you miss a Sunday, you know what you're saying? I don't care. I mean, some of you miss a Sunday because you're going to do things that are important. But when you just wake up and decide, I'm not going to church today, that's saying, I don't care. I don't love. You might say, I don't feel loved. What well, never starts with what you feel, does it? It always starts by what you do. And so we ought to do church this way. We ought, to, we ought to give because love drives us. Because we want to make sure we're able to pay our youth minister and our children's minister because we love them, but more than that, because we love our kids. We, we want to have a bus that actually runs because we love our senior citizens who go out once a month in it. You talk about a praying group, oh God, please. Despite our cultural differences, Paul is saying, hey, there's slave, there's, there's, there's slave owners, there's rich, there's poor, there's Greek, there's Jew. Despite all these differences, we ought to what? Love. 
whether you're a Tennessee fan, a Vanderbilt fan, or a former Kentucky fan, you ought to love. Whether you're a Republican or Democrat, you ought to love. It's time we put these cultural differences aside and say, that's enough. We ought to look around this room today and despair that what's in this room doesn't reflect what's outside of this room culturally. And the reason why is because it's easy to love somebody who looks like you and has the same amount of money as you, who has the same background as you. But it's hard to love somebody that's different, amen? But that's our command. Despite our financial differences, we ought to love. Despite our racial differences, God help us, we ought to love. There is no room for racism in the church. There's no room for it. Despite political differences, we ought to love. Despite disagreements over what color the church ought to be, we ought to love. No matter what disagreements come, no matter what differences exist, no matter which direction we're going, love conquers all. Love covers all. Love never fails. There was an unusual military funeral in California in December of 2013. Sergeant First Class Joseph Gant, who fought both in World War II and in the Korean War, was laid to rest. He had been captured in Korea in 1950 and died the following year, but his body was never returned. And his death was never confirmed by the North Koreans. And so his wife, Clara, waited for decades for her husband to come home. She regularly went to meetings with government officials seeking information about what had happened. Clara even bought a house and had it professionally landscaped so that when Joseph got home, all he would have to do is go fishing. Did you hear that, Angelos? She was 94 years old when his remains were finally brought home for a military funeral with full honors. It wasn't the homecoming that she had dreamed of, but she finally knew his fate. Clara told a reporter who interviewed her, quote, he told me if anything happened to him, he wanted me to remarry. And I told him, no, no, here I am, still his wife. And I'm going to remain his wife until the day the Lord calls me home. If we failed in the past, we don't have to fail in the future, amen? God in Christ has loved us that way. Let us love one another.